I want to talk to you about your most recent collection because there was a huge reaction to that. And as we said, not all of it completely positive, but definitely a really excited reaction. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that menswear show because for me that was such a standout from the London shows because I think more than any other designer you really challenged menswear and you pushed it somewhere. It wasn't really just clothes, it was about what menswear could be. Was that something that was very intentional with that show? I don't, I don't think, in, in terms of the men's show, I didn't intentionally go out to... I think people f find when they see something which they, uh, which they don't expect from a designer, I think they ultimately think you're going out to shock, which it wasn't the idea. The idea was for me that was just exactly where I saw menswear in three months time, if you know what I mean. I, I think it's, I, I saw it about a dialogue, you know, for me, always a show is about like storytelling. You know, I'm originally Irish and I, I grew up there. And in Ireland, it's all about storytelling. And I wanted the show to feel like a dialogue between the mother and the son. What is that dialogue? Not in a, like a shocking way. And I feel, I feel like that was the idea, it was that boundary between, not actually between masculine and femininity, but between a male and a female mind, if you know what I mean, like a, a, a homogenous wardrobe. The idea that clothing is just clothing. It doesn't matter who wears it, it's a, it's a point of view, it's, you know, it's what you decide to pick up. You know, I don't think necessarily clothing can be feminine or masculine. I think it's just a character. You know, ultimately you have to build a character in the show. And, and I feel like it worked. It was one of the shows I actually, it was a, it was a very personal show for me, not in, in the either mother and son relationship, but just in terms of the overall impact of it. Do you know what I mean? When you start to, when, I, when we start to come up with looks and you see them realized, you know when something, it, you're, you're hitting something which looks awkward in you in your own mind. The show still doesn't make sense to me, but I hope that when it's produced and in shops, next year it will. Do you know what I mean? So it should make sense now. For me I would say that obviously there's a huge amount of change happening with London menswear at the moment but still at the root of menswear is this inherent conservatism about how yeah. men should dress, what masculinity is and what menswear should be about. Do you find that? Do you find that quite restrictive? I think that kind of... I find it really restrictive but ultimately I, when I come to to come to the to execute the final thing, I will always push it further than I've ever pushed it. And some seasons it works really well, and some seasons it's goddamn awful. Do you mean that's the way, that's the risk that you take if you're going to do something like that? Um, things will never like. I think ultimately, if I, I think the the issue is the, the issue that lies within clothing and even in women's wear is. We put clothing on our body to, well, it's part of psyche, it's part of that. You know, there is a psychology to what you wear. Do you want to sleep with someone who looks like a Christmas tree? Not really. But the concept of that, of clothing, and the idea of like the pairing of it, I think you can still get away with something which is extreme, but teamed with something. And I feel like we, if we, you know, People, you're, you're more likely to want to sleep with a guy in jeans and a t-shirt. It's more sexy, it's more, that's what it's about. But does that help in industry? I don't think so. I think we have to push things. Things have to still be pushed because ultimately, in 10 years time, that will be normal. That's the way it works. It's very frustrating sometimes when you, you want to take risk in your own soil but we're, you're blocked by conservative viewpoints, you're blocked by money. We live in a world that we, you know, you've got to sell so much to be able to get by. I have to pay a team of nine. I have to have my basics. I have to have those things. And it's sometimes really sad when you come up with something which you inherently believe is something, that one idea that is new, and it, it disappears. I want to talk about, actually, I want to go back to the beginning, and that's something you just mentioned then, about growing up and seeing clothes and just having that thirst for them. Because um, we've talked about the present, but I want to find out when your interest in fashion first came about, like when your, your first sort of relation with fashion developed, was that at a very young age? I think I've always been aware of clothing. 
like my grandfather was a textile designer and a creative director of a, a print company. I've always been kind of aware of like, I, he used to always like push me on proportion and like proportional balance of color and design and pattern and how to do repeat patterns and or how to jar colors together to create something new you know he used to work on camouflage and you know like kind of like liberty and things like that where you were trying to create patterns as an overall vibe even if it's for a tea towel or a sofa um i think through that i kind of became a like i was at a younger age i was obsessed with my fabric like i would just like like a piece of fabric would be like you know, if it was like silk, it was like genius. It was like so amazing. Like a silk scarf was like an incredible thing. I don't know. I don't know why, but it, I was always into that level. But I ultimately wanted to, weirdly, I, I started off being in a lot of youth theater and doing drama. And I was in the National Music Theater and I was in the National Youth Theater. And and I was obsessed with this idea of, you know, like proper stage. Like I did like this play called The Dreamers and it was like an adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream and in which I was a fairy running around a stage and I did stage combat and I, you know, I did part of like Richard II and I, I, I was obsessed. And then I went to Washington DC to study at a school there and became more and more obsessed. And then I think I woke up one, mor one morning during the process of being at drama school, I was doing like the Alexander technique and, and I think I was doing a class in it and it was like lying on the floor where you're like thinking about your spine. And then I was like, I just wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling me enough in a way. And I don't think I could have ever brought an, something modern to it. I don't know if I could have, maybe I wasn't right for, I wasn't right for acting at all because I was too, I wanted to create characters, but I was, I wanted to create external characters, not an internal character. Which is maybe something really confusing, I don't know about that, that makes sense. But it was that, that idea I would rather have made a, a kind of like something you can put over someone to create a character than actually become the character myself. So how did you make the move from acting to fashion? Was that quite a difficult decision? It, se it sounds mm. like it was something quite spontaneous. But It was very spontaneous. I dropped out in the second year and got hopped on a flight and went back and then I was confronted by my parents to pay back my my duties on all those bills I'd racked up and I my dad was coaching a rugby team in, in Southern Ireland and I blagged my way and got a job in Brown Thomas in this department store which is owned by Selfridges and it, there's another one in Canada which is part of the same group which is I think it's the Western family in there. So I started working in the men's super brand department and it was like Prada, it was like YSL, it was when Dior had started and like when Dolce & Gabbana was like big and it was like it was for me like menswear was this like new thing it was like so exciting you know there was something really exciting about it and one day when I was in there uh, a guy from Prada had popped by and he was like can you help me merchandise some reels and I merchandised then this Prada collection which was with Holiday and Brown prints and there was like bags and it was, it was an amazing collection and in the store we had Prada Sport and Prada Mainline so we mixed it all together and he was like well if you ever come to London you can get a job so then obviously I was like London how amazing would that be I can get out of here and do something there but I, I stayed for a while and I never followed it up and then it was weirdly in the store when I, I then decided uh, I'm cutting kind of too forward I, I then decided to apply for art school and I got turned on by St. Martins I got turned on by many schools but there was London College of Fashion had like a menswear course and there was lots of spaces on it. <laughs> so I was like, great, here's my menswear offering. This is what I've done before. I've merchandised three racks and here's some awful draw sketches. Can I go? And they were like, fine. I had the grades to get in. So I went and through that process, I obviously in London became obsessed by clothing, completely had forgot drama 
completely. Like it was never like a thing. I was like, it was like, it was done. I was like finished. I was now straight into an obsession over like being in the library, like consuming magazines, like there was no tomorrow, like going through everything. And um, I then went into Prada one day and then uh, this guy Walter was like, oh, why did you get back to me? This is a woman called Manuela Pavese, would you like a job? I was like, well, I'm poor and of course. So I was like, forgot the idea of school. So I, did, I, I ran alongside and did both. I did, turned up to class, if even, within the first two years. Not at all sometimes, but for a whole year. And um, I was working in Prada with, this, with, um, with a team there and then with this woman called Manuela Pavese who, who has been a huge inspiration to me because I think I love her vision. She like does the visual communications there and her styling is incredible. Her photography makes sense to me. And it was such an amazing moment because it was like someone like thrashing you to push, push an idea. How to, to make a mannequin look interesting in a store, how to sell to a consumer. And to be honest, I learned more working at Prada than as a visual merchandiser with someone who I truly believed in than I ever learned at London College of Fashion. And I found it very, I, I realized that you could never teach it. You had to like get out there and like be in the depth of the shit of it and like wade through it until you could work out what it's about. <laughs> I re I'm actually, I picked up on something you said then about your time at Prada, you said how to sell clothes, that's what you learned when you were there. And I wanted to ask you later on, but we've kind of come to it early, about <coughs> that fusion between commerciality and creativity. Mm. And it seems for you like you've embraced that as a very positive thing, how to sell something, what oh, you yeah. want. Oh yeah, you have to, or you'll become, ult ultimately you will not have a job, and ultimately you'll be extremely depressed because you want to see your clothing on people and you want to see it everywhere as much as possible. That's why, for example, we're doing a Topshop collaboration. I want people of all age demographics to buy it. Fashion cannot be elite at all. In the modern world, it isn't possible. Luxury, if luxury is a form of elitism, then I don't want to be part of it. I'm interested in that moment for you where you kind of, because you said earlier in our conversation, we've been going a long time, but people kind of became aware of us recently. Where was that moment for you when you're... I don't know. I think it, but you, uh, the only time you ever know is that people start to shoot your clothing. And you're like, oh, it's there. Or someone wears it. That commerciality thing again. That big word. But um, I think you just start... I, I, I find it very difficult because I, I, I'm in a studio and I, I'm staring out a window and at my desk and I, you know, I work with a stylist, Benjamin Bruno, who, who is really... You know, who is my dialogue. <laughs> It's very insular. I sometimes forget what's going on. Really forget. But I think you have to. I never, you know, I do sometimes get caught up in sales because ultimately I want to know how much I can spend on the next show. And, you know, and you fight to try to, I think some people, you know, I think some people see the problem with the, the industry that I find, and that's why I can never, I find it very difficult going out or in getting involved in it, is that I think people see clothing as this like fantastical like mega money machine it's like it's like the diet coke thing it's like coca-cola i know the name so if if i apply that to anything else and i suddenly if one person knows your name they feel that you're just as big as coca-cola then it's like they feel that i get in and out of a cab every day i have like a staff of 45 at my house and i live in this like but the reality is actually I smoke 40 cigarettes a day, I need a Mars bar, and I'm working 24 hours a day <laughs> to try to keep it going. And um, my biggest thing at the end of the month is paying the staff. Like, that's my biggest responsibility. I'm married to, ultimately I'm married to my job and my business, and it has to come first because people's lives are, depend on having a job. And that's tough, and I think that's sometimes why I find that, you know, yes, we have come to, someone's found, we have, being started to be noticed, which is incredible. And I'm, it really makes it exciting because I want people to know what I'm doing and I believe in what I'm doing. But sometimes the insularness of like 10,000 bills coming through the post and you're an accountant, you are a friend, you are personnel, you are trying to organize a show, you're pulling all these people in to help. 
it sometimes is very you, to actually know what's actually physically going on out there is impossible sometimes and you're trying to be aware of what's going on um, but it's it, it's you, some days you're just some days it's tough because you're kind of trying to balance everything at once balance the books balance people you know try to you know I don't go out to be liked by everyone I'm not I you either like it or get it and I think I'm hoping that some people are starting to like what we do eventually I would hope I'm like praying <laughs>